for such a nice introduction. I really appreciate uh, being here today. It's been an amazing month conference. It's been an amazing time so, so far, and I really want to thank everyone for attending. You've had such good, thoughtful questions in the previous session, so it's been, it's been great. So I, I want to, I guess the previous talk, the keynote, is a good lead-in to, to what I want to go over today. And I really want to use this as an opportunity to tell you a little bit about precision medicine, so a little bit about what you heard before. But I also want to use this opportunity to show you some real cutting-edge research that goes on in the lab. So what we do on a daily basis. And then I want to give you the opportunity to ask me questions. So I will definitely save enough time to ask me questions about any part of it, some big picture questions or specifics of the research. I'm going to show you some really cool videos that we take. They're, they're one of a kind, uh, one of the few uh, places in the country, if not the world, that, that can actually do these things. So I want to kind of start off just with bigger picture ideas and then how it relates directly to our research at, at the Winship Cancer Institute. So this is just a slide um, showing basically the cancer rates over several decades. Right. So you can look at it and you can see the blue line, the big blue line shows lung cancer. Right? So that completely, the increase shows uh, basically smoking, and then the drop off shows new treatments, it shows new ways to detect uh, smoking uh, quitting programs that are out there. Um, you can also see we made progress in let's say prostate cancer as well, which is that black line over there. Um, did I really dim the lights just a little bit? To, to dim the lights just a little bit? It doesn't have to be completely dark, but, 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 but maybe just a little bit, yeah. That would be great. So, and then, and then other cancers, you know, we haven't made that much progress, like pancreatic cancer, brain tumors, okay? Not much progress ha has been made in those. So there's, we've clearly made a dent in the way that we treat and detect cancer, but there's so much further to go. And you heard a bit this morning about the new ideas that are out there. So I want to talk a little bit about that, but I want to also show you a little bit of the biology behind some of this. So I'm going to play this movie. This is taking place over three days. It's sped up. Does anybody know what we're looking at? Say it again. Dividing cells, right? So we're looking at mitosis, right? So this, this is real mitosis. These are uh, breast cancer cells, actually, that start off at about, what do we have, maybe 20 cells. You can see a cell here, for instance, maybe about 20 on day one, right? And uh, by day three, you have you know a couple hundred cells in this field of view. And you can actually see all, all the phases of mitosis. You can spot when it gets really bright, that's metaphase, for instance, right? And they separate apart and you get anaphase and telophase and so forth. So it really happens, right? You don't just learn in a textbook. This is, this is the real biology of cancer. It, it's fascinating for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that if you were to look at a dog cell, if you look at a carrot cell, if you were to look at pretty much any animal cell or plant cell or even yeast, for instance, it looks nearly identical. Cancer cells are not that different in this respect. Okay, so it's a well-conserved process, down, down to the most basic organisms. Microtubules and the spindle do this. Okay? The other thing that's kind of fascinating is that, for the most part, this growth, while it looks really bad, is not the reason why people die of the disease. You may think it's this massive growth, you get a big tumor, but most people do not die from the growth of the disease. Okay? Surgeons are really good at taking out the initial tumor. People live through surgery. We've gotten very far. So that's not the problem. I'll show you what the problem we think is. This is another movie. These are cells, these are cells moving. So you have a whole bunch of lung cancer cells on the bottom left and a whole bunch on the top right. This is overnight. This is over one day. And you can see this movement on these cancer cells. This is also known as cancer invasion, cancer motility, cancer metastasis. Have you heard the word malignant? If a cancer is malignant or not, that means a motile cell, or it's metastatic is another word that, 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 that we use. 
So metastatic disease across nearly all different types of tumors, you know, lung cancer, breast cancer, whatever it may be, the movement of it is why people die of the disease. If we could stop, if we could stop this movement, we could actually make cancer a chronic disease so people can live with it. Okay? So we don't necessarily have to kill the cancer cells, but can we stop them from moving? And this is the, one of the big things that, that my laboratory works on, is how you actually stop this process from happening. Now to do that, you have to understand why it happens in the first place, right? So you need to understand why they move and how they move, and then you can develop new medicines that stop it from moving. So I want to take a step back here for, for a minute and kind of show you just some basic stuff that he was discussing in his, in his previous lecture. So you should all recognize this, right? It, it's our 46 human chromosomes, right? And we spoke a lot about genes and DNA and, all, and, and those sorts of things. And living on here, right, are basically most of our genes that control growth, development, aging, right? Pretty much most processes that happen um, across all organisms, right? Across all organisms, it's pretty much the same. So when things become abnormal, Okay, when the DNA becomes abnormal, this is when cancers arise. Okay, so, so if we look at it from this standpoint, the idea of mutation. So may, maybe some people think of mutations as, as something like this, right? If you, Google, if you Google mutations, you know, you may get something that, that, that looks like that. But we actually use the word, word mutation quite, quite different, right? Um, we actually think of a mutation in, uh, as a change in the DNA, right? And this kind of goes back to some really interesting history that, that probably people learn in, in, in biology, right? They learn about Gregor Mendel, and he was this monk that essentially uh, cataloged, you know, basically hereditary, her, hereditary in, in pea plants, okay? He had no idea what DNA was, no idea of genes or the hereditary material or anything like that, okay? He was just looking at traits, at phenotypes, and documenting how they change over multiple generations. And, and all these ideas of dominant and recessive, I mean, they're still extremely important today. We use them. They're the foundations of, of, of what, what we understand in cancer. So when we think of mutations, I want you just to understand, and this is what he was alluding to in his lecture, is that when we talk about mutations, there are many different kinds. There's insertions, there's deletions, um, there's truncation mutations. But it's just in the most simplest sense is you have something normal like an A, right? And it gets changed to a C. Okay, that's the most simplest sort of sense of mutation. Single mutations can drive cancer. A single mutation. Or, in most cases, it's many mutations over time. Okay, that's why most children don't get cancers, because these mutations happen over decades. Okay, now there are a few types of mutations, like we spoke about uh, Angelina Jolie and BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. Those are hereditary. Um, another example would be like, like retinoblastoma in children. It goes to a single gene, the RB, the retinoblastoma gene. But most of the cancers that we see, whether it's lung cancers or breast cancers, most of them, from what we understand, are not hereditary. They're more complex, too. They have numerous mutations, thousands of mutations, thousands of mutations um, across the genome. So, so how do we approach this? And, and, and we discussed a little bit about this uh, this morning, the idea of the Human Genome Project. Did you guys ever hear of Human Genome Project? Yeah. So Human Genome Project, you know, as was mentioned, took place uh, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, they wanted to sequence one, one human genome. So one, right? And this cost, you know, a couple billion dollars. A couple billion dollars to do. It took over a decade. Over a decade. And it, and it made the news, right? This was like big news. This was like the front cover of Time magazine. I mean, this was like, you know, over all the newspapers and the televisions before the internet. So, so basically, this was all over the place. This was a big deal to sequence one human genome. In fact, it was actually a few, few different people's genome uh, together. Um, I still think they actually are, are, are anonymous uh, of, of whose genome it, it, it was. Um, so this is the game changer, this Human Genome Project. Um, there was a really nice graph laid out this morning of how that changed the cost of sequencing. I'm not going to get into that. 
Um, new technologies developed out of that that are all driving cancer care today. And not just cancer, just, just uh, treatment across many different uh, diseases. So I want to make the point that now, okay, within the next year, the next five years or so, everything will be sequenced. And I hope that was, was made before in the previous lecture. Everything will be sequenced because it is much more cost effective now. The technology is available. And when I say everything, right now we're just sequencing mainly the tumor, right? The bad stuff. Okay? But it's going to change. We're going to be sequencing the good stuff too, right? Because why do you want to sequence the normal tissue? Because you want to compare it, right? You want to compare normal to tumor in the same patient. And there's a scenario where you sequence at the beginning of treatment. But what's going to happen is we're going to start sequencing during treatment, two years after treatment, three years after treatment. And it's going to look at how the tumor itself changes over time. And this is really, really important, and I'm going to get to that in, in a little bit, is how do cancers change over time? So this is a game changer, and I wanted to show you the paradigm, the, the, the model of how this is going to happen in, in very simple terms. So we have our two groups of people, our blue people and, and our red people up here. Um, and right now, let's say they all have lung cancer. Let's just say they all have lung cancer, just as an example. We say, well, you have this type of lung cancer. It looks like lung endocarcinoma, for instance, um, because under the microscope, they originated from a certain type of cell population in the lung. So we say, you're all the same. You all get um, treatment with a platinum compound, for instance. So they're all treated that way with chemotherapy. But now with sequencing, it's going to completely revolutionize what's happening. So we're sequencing the DNA. And what's, and what's revealed from this is that, let's say the group of red people have mutations in genes A and B, for instance, okay? And the blue people have mutations in genes C and D, um, for instance. So we've separated out the two groups. Now in reality, there's probably 10 or 15 or maybe 20 different groups from what we understand. But we're able to separate out the two groups. And this is really, really important because what we can do is now give group uh, mutations in genes A and B. We can now give them treatment, let's say treatment one, just to be very generic here. And genes C and D would get treatment two. So, no, so originally it's always based upon how it looks, how it behaves. But now we're basing treatment on the actual mutations, the molecules that drive the treatment. It's a much more logical and it, it, it's, it's a much more intuitive way of doing this. Now, let's say in the case here, we may already have treatment one. Let's say treatment one exists, it targets gene and protein A that exists. In some cases, we don't yet have this treatment. It may not exist yet. And we're working on identifying the treatment that would go against this population, that would be useful. Okay, so this is sort of the, the future model, and, and I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about something that is going to happen in 10 years or 20 years, but we're actually doing this now, and I want to just give you a few examples of, of how that's happening. And this whole process, just to reemphasize of, of what he said earlier, is known as personalized cancer medicine or precision cancer medicine. They're slightly different, but, but in general mean, mean, mean the same thing. So what are some examples? Um, I, I, want to, I want to point to this one for, uh, uh, as an example. Melanoma is skin cancer. Okay? There were no treatments for a couple decades. No new treatments. Nothing works. Okay? Well, it was discovered that actually half, if not more, of patients with melanoma have mutations in a gene called BRAF. Okay? So that's a high amount. 50% is, is a really high number. You don't see that across most, most cancer types. So high that what it likely means is that this BRAF protein drives the cancer. So it's, they're called driver mutations because they're so important. Uh, and the opposite would be a passenger mutation that kind of just goes along for the ride. Um, so BRAF is a driver mutation. And what was developed once this knowledge was clear was an obvious thing, a BRAF inhibitor. Okay? But there's actually a, another part of the story. The first inhibitor that was developed against BRAF basically targeted normal BRAF and mutant BRAF, so the abnormal BRAF. 
And that didn't work so well. But once the inhibitor was made to specifically target the mutant form of BRAF, it completely changed the game for skin cancer patients, for melanoma patients in particular. This is a big deal. This is given, I can't remember exactly, maybe a few weeks after treatment, all these black dots show like an active tumor mass. And you can see it, it's everywhere in the bone, right? Skin cancer can be very painful disease. And it's nearly completely gone after two weeks. I mean, this is an amazing example that was never before seen anything like this. Um, but it shows you this is an intelligent treatment. We're not just hitting everybody with the same treatment. We're personalizing the medicine. I want to show you a more recent example, actually, that, uh, that, that that's something that, that we partly work on as well. This is, this is lung cancer, OK? So uh, I'll kind of walk you through this. It's kind of an interesting biology. That, that's here. There are a few patients, it's mainly like 5 to 10% of patients, maybe even less, that their lung cancer is driven by what's called a translocation, a chromosome translocation. So let's take a normal patient. This EML4, this red gene, sits by itself on one chromosome. The green gene, ALK, sits by itself on another chromosome. But what happens in these patients is that these two come together. Okay, so when red and green come together, they make yellow, and this is the actual diagnostic test to test for patients. Okay, so this is called an EML4-ALK translocation, EML4-ALK. It's called ALK-positive lung cancer. Again, it's maybe 5% of patients. And what was developed were ALK inhibitors. This all happened within like five years, which is like super fast for, for any sort of treatment. So patients that are ALK-positive go right on this treatment. Um, and it's pretty effective. I mean, these are patients that had nothing for years, no real options except for chemotherapy. And now we're able to take this small piece of the pie, this 5% of people, and give them a treatment based upon this biology, which was developed from next generation sequencing and things that you heard about in the previous lecture. So this is, this is major progress. And I think this example is actually, in some ways, uh, more likely how it's going to proceed in the future is that they're going to be small 5%. Most likely it's not going to be the 50 or 60% of people. Those have probably been discovered at this point. It's likely going to be 5%, 5%. So you may have 20 different treatments for one patient population. Let's say for all lung cancer patients, there may be 20 different treatments. And again, I want to highlight that this is happening now. Okay, This isn't some far-fetched idea. Um, that, that, that's going on. So, so the question of, of you know, hype and hope and all that, I really believe that we're at the tip of the iceberg here. As we understand more of the biology, everything underneath this is going to be discovered. The real way to beat this cancer is to understand it, just like anything else, right? How could you go in there and just fix a, you know, an engine of a car without knowing how it works? Right? It makes no sense. So now the biology, the understanding, is playing such a huge role um, in how we treat patients. And he showed really nice diagrams this morning of how research and clinical care are coming together. And these are great examples of, of that as well. So I just want to also point out that there are, are challenges in here as well. And some of these we alluded to, but some of these are, are not, you know, may not be directly addressed. But I really want to point this out. Those charts that he was showing, um, getting uh, oncologists and surgeons and pathologists and bioinformaticists to work together is not so easy. To get people to come to the table and actually sit and exchange ideas and make this happen over several days or several weeks is not very easy to do. So there's a quite a big logistical challenge in making this happen. And every cancer institute across the country, if not internationally, is trying to figure this out. How do we make this work? And how do we make it work in an effective and rapid manner? That's really important, because you need things to happen fast when it comes to cancer treatment. You can't wait months for a diagnosis and a treatment. It has to be weeks, okay, or less. So that is a major challenge of integrating sequencing, informatics, and treatment together. And there's a lot of people that typically don't speak to each other professionally that have to actually start to talk and communicate. So another thing is patient access. Who will have access to this? 
right? These sorts of things. Every patient should have access to it. But how do we make sure that whether you're living in an urban city or out in the country, everyone has access to next generation sequencing. Everyone has access to this sort of treatment option. This is a big, important point. Um, that is now, these are things that are now being addressed. No one has the absolute answer of it. You'll hear a lot about ethics from different people. We, they discuss some of these things. Who has, and I'll just load up these next couple of on. Who has access to this data? Security, privacy, things that, that we sort of mentioned before. These are major, major challenges. These are all outside, outside my field. But we discuss them, and again, it's people coming to the table like ethicists, and cancer biologists talking to each other for the first time to understand what's the best way of doing it. And the last one is the idea of TMI, or too much information. So this is what happens. This is what happens. And you sequence a whole exome, right? You have millions, billions of, of base pairs, tons, half a terabyte of information there, thousands of mutations. What does it all mean? We have no idea. We only know what a few of these things mean, right? Um, he talked about 37 actionable targets and things like that. We have so much information in front of us, but what is the important information? That's a challenge. What is, I said, the driver mutations versus the passenger mutations? That is a really, really important challenge for us. And until the biology, so the technology is there. We can do this, we can do it in a week but the biology is not yet there. We don't know what it means. And that's something that we're trying to work on in the lab. So that's sort of a bigger picture overview. I want to show you a little bit of the real research that goes on in the lab. Um, and some of these things are really unique and novel and some techniques that, that we developed um, that we haven't released yet. And I think that they're kind of interesting. And I want to, I want to add another layer of complexity to this. So, I said that you have a mutation, right? A patient has a mutation in a gene. Truth is, is that if you look at a tumor, okay, so imagine this is one patient's tumor. Not every cancer cell, this is really important, not every cancer cell has the same mutation, okay? So what does this mean? That if you pull out a chunk of the tumor here, or if you pull a chunk of the tumor here, or a chunk, they may actually have different mutations. This is a big, big problem. Because if it is this heterogeneous, we will have a problem treating patients no matter what. Because imagine this scenario. You go in, you sequence, it has a mutation, you kill off the yellow part, maybe the pink part of the tumor, but the blue part doesn't have that mutation. Okay? And it grows back. This is a big, big problem. It's called tumor heterogeneity. There are papers that are just coming out now saying that that this is the reason why all treatments don't work. This is the reason, is because you kill a piece of, of the tumor and the rest grows back. <clears throat> I told this to an oncologist friend of mine, and he said it makes you want to hang up your stethoscope. He said it's really, really scary. So this to me is one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle, is not just figuring out what's different between patients, okay, but what's different within the patient, intratumor heterogeneity, and what I'm gonna show you is, is how we're tackling this. This, to me, is one of the biggest problems in the field. Okay, so this is a real lung tumor from a patient, okay? You, so actually, the cancer cells are here. They make this sort of sweeping uh, figure out here, and then these are sort of the normal cells in there. And um, studying cancer like this, it, it, you, could, you could just look at them, and you could see that these cancer cells are all quite different. They don't all look the same. They don't all behave the same. We're only looking at a snapshot of this. But what if I want to know, what if I want to know what's wrong in this cancer cell here? It's very difficult to do. We have no idea if that's the, work, the really bad cancer cell. We don't know if that's the cancer cell that grows a lot. We don't know if that's the cancer cell that moves a lot. So how do we approach this? How do we figure out what's different from this cancer cell, from this one, or from any other one? That's the challenge that we took up a few years ago, and this is work completely done by myself and a graduate student in, in the lab. So what did we do? So what we did was this. We actually took a, a mass of cancer cells, so there's about, I'll say a few thousand cancer cells in this mass, and I'll show you what they do. This is overnight. And we 
watch these videos over and over again. So when you look at something like this, there are cancer cells that go out really fast. Okay, so let so let, let me let wait, wait for it to loop and rewind. So here's a really fast chain that goes out. There's nearly nothing going out over here. There are more chains up there. Um, why do these cancer cells go out while the other cancer cells don't? We don't we don't know the answer to that. What makes this cell that's in the front really really important? Is there anything important about it? We have no idea. Um, what about the cells in the back of the chain? Are they different from the cells in the front of the chain? We have, we have no idea what the difference is of the cancer cells. So we started looking at these videos and we asked the question, are the cells that are in the front of the chain, that, that front cell, is it really important? So we started watching those specifically. So this is a cell coming out of the front and watch that so fall off, and what happens to the chain? Nothing. It can't move anymore. I'll, I'll replay it so you can see it again. So here comes out the chain. That front cell falls off right there, first two, and then the chain can't move anymore. It makes you think, perhaps, perhaps that front cell is really important. And, and we actually think they're really smart. Watch this video. Here comes out the front cell. It doesn't have anyone behind it. We call the front cell the leader cell. It actually goes back and makes a U-turn to grab the follower cells. Now these are sort of anecdotes, right? These aren't, these aren't um, we see this every once in a while. We don't know what it means, but we know that they're smart. Perhaps this leader cell wants follower cells. Maybe that's important for it. This whole idea of these leader follower cells is known as collective invasion. So it's a group invasion. It's not just one cell going off and doing its own thing, but it's a group. So we started um, plotting these cells and doing more analysis of it. And I'm just going to sort of show you just some of the important things. Um, basically, when a, a chain has a leader follower on there, it moves much faster than when it doesn't. And when a leader comes off, the chain can't move anymore. So these leader cells, you know, we, want, we always want to quantitate and analyze the data the data. These leader cells are really important. And you can actually, these are plots of leader cells making a U-turn to go back and finding its follower cells. So these are leader cell coming back, a leader cell coming back, just to convince ourselves that what we're seeing is real, right? And not just made up in our heads. Okay. So then we're still left with the problem of how do we go in there? We want to know what, what makes these leader cells so bad. How do we go in there and grab one of these cells, right? A cell is about 20 micrometers. So think about a millimeter, and then there's a thousand microns in a millimeter, so this is 20 microns. So obviously you can't, you can't see without a microscope. So how do we go in there and actually grab the leader cell while it's alive, right? Because we need the cells alive. So we developed this technique, this was developed about two years ago, where we Zap, where we zap the front cell, and use this. So here's a leader cell. We zap the cell and turn it from green to red. It has a special protein in there that's called dendra. And what dendra can do is if you shine a slight burst of UV light on it, it converts it from green to red. The point is that when you do that, you can make it like a highlighter. You can highlight cells, just like if you would highlight a page in your book. You can highlight cells. So I could say, I want to highlight this cell, make it red. I could take a microscope on it, shine a laser on it for about a second or two, and the cell is now red. And no other cells near it are red. So it's very, very specific. And we can control this very easily with the software. So, so what we did was we zapped all the leader cells, okay, and we left all the follower cells green. And then we put it through a machine that's called a cell sorter. And basically what that machine does is it takes only the red cells out and leaves the green cells and separates them into two different wells. Um, and then basically we can analyze, the, we can do genomic analysis on it. So it's very simple. It took about two years again to actually do. So I make it sound like it's easy, but it actually took quite a while. Um, and this is the video just to show you what cell sorting is like. All these green cells come in. And then basically we take our one red cell and we're able to actually pull it out and put it in a separate well. And this animation just sort of, sort of shows you how that happens. 
So we zap the cells with a microscope, but we sort it using the we sort it using this 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 machine. Um, so it makes it really easy. This is just a real example of it right here. So this is us taking, here's this group of cells that we want, and they're green, and then we zap it, and this group of cells become red. We can even do it for one single cell. We can have green, and then we zap the cell, and it becomes red. And you can see no other cell behind it is red. Only that specific cell it takes about a second or two. And then we send it through that cell sorter machine, and we're able to, uh, to detect it. So what we did were, we think, we think we made the first ever lines that are pure leader cell lines. Only leader cells are together and only follower cells. And you can see how different they are. Follower cells hardly invade, and look at the leader cells only. We've taken something that's so rare, and we now have millions, unlimited supply of these leader cells. And they behave strikingly different than the follower cells. So this for us is a real game changer because now we can actually study these leader cells by themselves. And there are all sorts of experiments that we're going to do. Some of them are actually quite simple, which I'll show you right now. So we asked the question, if we mix okay, leader cells, which are red, and follower cells, which are green in this case, if we put them back together, right? so we separate them and put them back together, are leader cells still the actual leaders? So do they retain leadership no matter what? And the answer is yes, they still end up, even when you separate them and put them back together, they still end up as a leader cell on a group, 95% of the time. And it's just another example showing the same thing. Here's the red leader cell out of the front. So it's very fascinating that we can actually put these cells back together. They have a memory, so they're able to remember and understand what it is they were doing to actually drive invasion. We have a whole bunch of other things that, that we did with this as well. One of the cool things that we did was we did genomic analysis on it. And, and it's just, it's real simple here. Basically what you're looking at are genes that change in the leaders versus genes that change in the follower cells. And there's quite a lot of differences between the two groups. Um, one of the, the most important differences that we saw was that there seemed to be two main differences between leader cells and follower cells. One of them is on this pathway called the VEGF pathway, and I'll tell you about it in a second. And the other is, is the adhesion pathway. Adhesion is like when a cell sticks and moves. So we're actually quite excited to see the adhesion pathway come up because it sort of validates that these cells are stickier and able to move better. But this was a little bit of a surprise. The VEGF pathway is actually really important for blood vessel growth. So when blood vessels grow, um, it's called angiogenesis. I have it on the next slide, I think. Um, when blood vessels grow, they actually activate this VEGF pathway, pathway. And what happens is it's actually really fascinating. It's the same idea. There's a leader cell that grows out and has follower cells. So when you look at it, it looks identical um, just by eye. But it seems like, and this is where we are right now, it seems like the cancer cells uh, re-engage this pathway or activate this pathway again, not during blood vessel growth, but during cell motility, and this is completely new, and could reveal a whole new way of how we actually see these cancer cells moving and how they work in these collective uh, packs. So we're actually studying this a lot, and we're trying to figure out how do we now stop this, it's basically a blood vessel mimicry, a mimic, or a copy of what's going on normally, how these cancer cells are using this in a bad way. And we can confirm that this is the case, we can actually look at leader cells, and this is an antibody that, that stains uh, a player in that VEGF pathway. And you can see in leader cells, it really lights up really bright, but in follower cells, it's very dim. So we, we, we have to validate our findings, and this is just one way to validate it. So I just want to present to you uh, one scenario that we're trying to test. Um, and this is the idea that in the front, that leader cell is really invasive, and it takes this whole pack with it, right? This whole collective invasion pack. One question that remains in our head is, why doesn't it just go out on its own? Why doesn't it just go out and do its own thing? We don't know the answer to it, but we think, we think that these follower cells grow really well. So we think that the leader cells take the follower cells with them to wherever they go. It's kind of like, imagine like, uh, colonizing a new island, right? 
You want to have people that are maybe really good at building fires and people that are really good at building houses and people that can go out and search for food, right? It's the same idea during metastasis. Perhaps that there are specialists in the group that can actually cooperate together and actually develop a new site. So the idea would be that if you could get rid of one of these phenotypes or one of these types of cells, can we stop the whole process from happening? And this is all just speculation at this point. It's just an idea we have. Um, there's some evidence that the idea of cooperation happens in, in tumors already, and we're trying to basically test this idea in our model and how we can actually break, break it up as well. I, I told you about that already. So I want so that's sort of the end of, of sort of the research tale. I just want to I just want to uh, finish. I have two more slides. I just want to finish on, on one note, and, and uh, he kind of alluded to it before. Um, I just want to mention because you, you're, you're a young group about the next generation of scientists, and this is what this is something that I'm personally invested in in training the next generation of scientists and writing about this as well. Um, I, I really want to I, so. You know, how we portray scientists, right, is sort of, is sort of like this, right? You know, this, this is how scientists are on TV, right? I mean, look at this. I don't know. I mean, I don't think I look very much like some of them, but, but maybe, maybe I do. Maybe I act like them. But, but this is not really what it's like. And I hope that from hearing the previous lecture today and what I talked about, I mentioned a lot about teamwork. And this is going to grow. We rely on mathematicians. We rely on bioinformaticists, we rely on coders, we rely on engineers, we rely on numerous, numerous groups to get all that data that I showed you. So being a scientist is not just working with like bubbling flasks of liquid, you know, and that sort of thing. You have to work together in groups, usually they're well-coordinated groups that meet regularly, that are on the same page. It's really, really important to get, to get this to happen. So I really just want to highlight what your definition of a, or what you may think of what a scientist does is actually quite different than, 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 than how it's portrayed on television and things along those lines. So with that, um, I just want to I just want to acknowledge you know a bunch of the people in the lab. Uh, one of them is, is Jessica Conan, who she basically led the whole leader follow work um, by herself. A lot of our work in lung cancer in general is done by uh, this group over here. And as you can see, we collaborate with a lot of people. Um, pathologists, oncologists, geneticists, bioinformaticists, uh, geneticists again, another bioinformaticist, biostatistician, um, all groups of people need to work together to make this happen. You're not going to have one person who's in the lab one day and says, I found the cure to cancer. That's never ever going to happen in my opinion. Um, so you need to be able to work in groups and work as teams. Um, just some of my funding from the National Cancer Institute, and this is just a, actually a quite old picture of the lab. Um, it's about two or three years ago. And again, if you want any of the information, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, that's the blog. I also have a TEDx talk. So this is just a, a short promo. If you guys want to see my TEDx talk, it has some of these concepts, a little bit more of a lay audience idea, but, um, but it's on there as well. So uh, with that, I think it's pretty good timing. We have about 15 minutes or so. I'd be happy to answer any question about whatever it is, whether it's job discussion, science, or whatever it may be, I'd be happy to answer anything that, that, that you may have.